Good morning. How is the family of God doing today? Who's ready to worship God? Are you ready? Yes, put your hands together like this. He is alive. Sing with me. Oh, we praise you, God. all over this place. Cause you are, you are, you are my freedom we live to anger. Let's do that again, ready? Cause you are, you are, you are my freedom we live to anger. Psalm 106 says, praise the Lord, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Come on, let's give him praise in this moment. God, we thank you for who you are. We're here for you. Let's sing this together. And when I'm in the roughest wall, I won't go under, I won't drown. And when I'm in over my head, I know that you won't let me down. Cause when I'm broken and down to nothing, I know that you are always up to something good. Come on, everyone. Come on, everyone. Come on, everyone. I know that you are always up to something good. Don't make 
Let's lift our voices.
Let's start to sing that from deep inside. Sing it to him. As your glory fills this place, you alone deserve our praise. You're the name. Good morning, Fellowship of the Rockies. How are you? It's great to see all of you this morning. My name is Eli Finley. I'm the youth pastor here at the church. I just want to welcome you, whether you're joining us in person or online. It's just, I'm just thankful to be worshiping alongside you this morning. We're going to continue in this time of worship with the bringing of our tithes and offerings. And so if you'd like to give here at Fellowship of the Rockies, there are many ways that you can do that. You can do that online through our website. You can do that in the box in the back of this room or in the back of the theater. We have some in the hallway as well. Um, or you can mail it in, you can bring it in person. Any of those ways are okay with us. That is up between you and the Lord. It is just another way that we worship here is, is by trusting the Lord with our money and with our finances. I also want to encourage you this morning out of the book of Psalms. And so I'm, I'm going to read Psalm chapter 90, verses 13 and 14 in just a second here. But uh, it's a psalm of Moses. It's a prayer of Moses. And so long before King David, long before Jesus uh, that there are 150 psalms, and David is responsible for like half of them. Uh, but Moses wrote this psalm in, in a long, long time ago. It may be one of the first psalms that would have been collected and written. And so Psalm chapter 90, verses 13 and 14 say this, Lord, how long? Turn and have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your faithful love so that we may shout with joy and be glad in all of our days. And there's something in the scripture here in that last verse about his faithful love being the reason that we shout with joy. See, I don't know what you're, what you're carrying with you this morning. I don't know what you're coming to church with. I don't know what anxieties you have in your life. I do not know what you're walking through. I do know this, that you can find joy in the presence of God. You can find joy in the cross of Jesus Christ. You can find joy in his faithful love. His faithful love can bring us joy. It is the light at the end of the tunnel, and it is the light that we experience now. Is His faithful love. We're about to sing one more song, and it's about seeing victory. And what I want to encourage you with and remind you of today is that we do not have to worry about our own victory because we are fighting from Jesus' victory. He has already won. He has already claimed victory for us, and we partner and share in that glory alongside him because we are co-heirs with Christ. And that's what I want to remind you of as we worship. 
We worship in community and in the presence of Jesus Christ himself. Bow your heads, and I'm going to pray for you this morning. Father God, we love you and we trust you. In your son Jesus, his name is holy and it is worthy. We exalt him. We lift him up. We praise him with our mouths, with our hearts, with all of our being, Lord. Jesus, we just ask that as we pursue you and search for you this morning, that you just make yourself evident. God, we thank you that we don't have to beg you to be here with us, but we get to come freely into your presence because of the work of your son, Jesus. We're just reminded of his work on the cross as we come this morning to worship, to lift his name high. Jesus, it is in your holy, precious, and matchless name that we pray. Amen. you're praying for or what you're going through but God is speaking in this moment we can trust him sing it in confidence ready Let's show him honor. Let's show him glory. We believe in him. We believe in your promises, God. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe. I'll see you do it again. You know way. You made a way, God. When there is no way. And I believe. I see you do it again. I 
Let's give him praise. We thank you, Father, for who you are, and we trust in you, God. And in these moments and in our circumstances, through the good and through the bad, God, we, we say we trust you, that we love you, and we give you that control, Father. We want to live our lives for you and only you. So lead us, guide us, be in the midst of all that we are, all that we do, all that we say. We're excited to hear a word from you. Speak through us, God, through Pastor Charlie. We're ready to receive. In your son's name we pray. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. My name's Brittany. Welcome to Fellowship of the Rockies, and thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. Before this weekend's message, we'd like to take a few minutes and tell you about some things coming up for you and your family around Fellowship, so check this out. This year, we are excited to be partnering with Pueblo Cooperative Care and CASA, court-appointed special advocates to give back to the community in this time of hardship and suffering. CASA works to serve children who are abused and neglected, and we aim to alleviate some of their financial pressure through the toy drive, as they currently serve 300 children in our community. Pueblo Cooperative Care is a faith-based organization that provides resources to families and all the proceeds of the food drive will go to them. Items will be collected December 4th to 12th at weekend services or Monday to Thursday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. in our offices starting December 6th. Are you interested in getting baptized? Although we won't be baptizing in November, we will be baptizing in December. Our last baptisms for the year will be on December 11th and 12th. Contact Pastor Eli by filling out a Connect card or calling the front office if you have questions about baptism or want to be baptized. We will be having Christmas Eve services here at Fellowship. Join us on December 24th at one of our four services, 1 p.m., 3 p.m., 5 p.m., or 7 p.m. Pick up our Be Our Guest cards at the information desk and invite friends and family to one of our services, and we can't wait to see you there. Did you know that we have an app that helps you sign up for events? It also lets you sign up for life groups, see our calendar, access your giving, and even check in your kids for services. Download the Church Center app on your mobile device and search for Fellowship of the Rockies. Well, we are so glad to see you here this weekend. For more information on any events or ministries, please visit our website, fellowshipoftherockies.org, or stop in at the information desk in the foyer. Have a great week, and here's Pastor Charlie with a message. Hey, everybody. How are you? Good. Good morning to you. Obviously, in our announcements, we're still working on a couple of words like Pueblo and Casa. <laughs> and so uh, we hope to get that down before next week. And so, <laughs> and so anyway, it's just, anyway, we need to move on, but that's hilarious. And so 
I, I do like, this is one of my favorite weekends of the year because there's unbelievable unity in the church because we're all cowboy fans because the cowboys are playing the Chiefs. And so, um, so yeah, so, so now all of a sudden, yeah, now we know where you stand. Now you'll root for the cowboys when they play the Raiders or the Chiefs or something like that, then it, it helps you out. And so I know your motives aren't pure, but I still feel a love. And so... Uh, so our, we had a ladies' event this weekend that was phenomenal. Uh, Karen was there and told me, and, and some of you ladies were there as well. It was just phenomenal. Kelly Hall did a fabulous job. Donna Trainer and the, her leadership team and Pastor David and the TA team. And so if you weren't able to go uh, next time, uh, we'll, we'll have another one. And so you'll want to sign up for that as well. And then, then just one real quick announcement, and we'll, we'll open up the word together. Uh, a little bit of contact information for me. And, and let me tell you where this comes from. It comes out of my heart that, that there's, there's a lot of families that are walking through crisis and walking through difficulty. And my desire is if you need a pastor, you're able to get in touch with a pastor. And so here's what I've done. I just want to publish this. So that's my email address, and that is a cell number that goes directly to my phone. And so, uh, so, if, so you can take a picture of that. That's what I do. Uh, you can take a picture of that. You can put that in your contacts. And so that cell number, it, in fact, is both those, both those information, the email address, goes directly to my email. Nobody reads those. I don't have an assistant or anything that kind of uh, sorts it out or anything like that. It goes directly to me. And then that cell number goes directly to my cell phone. And so just a couple of boundaries, I guess, is Mondays and Fridays I try to take off. Mondays is my day off, and then Friday is like my Sabbath. Uh, but Jesus said that, that if your ox is in the ditch, you've got to break the Sabbath. And so I get emergencies, and I understand that. And so if you need me, you can text. I love to text. I think I have ninja <laughs> skills in texting. Texting. My kids would like question that because they like gifts and some of those other things. I think that's how you say that, gifs or whatever it is. Well, now I'm exposing my limitations. And so, uh, but you can text me. I respond well to text. You can call me, whatever. Those numbers, those numbers are for you. So if you have your Bible's electronic devices, you can click to turn to, uh, to Acts chapter 27. And so if you've been with us, you know that we've been walking through a series and we've just looking at biographies of men and women of Scripture, how we could, one, get, them, get to know them better, and then two, how we could take their principles and apply it into to our life and our situation. So uh, we're in the New Testament today, and we're going to look at the life of the Apostle Paul. And so when you look at the Apostle Paul's life, you realize that, that he, was either, he was either headed into a storm, he's in a storm, or he's coming out of a storm. That's kind of his, his, his life. That's what causes some people to say in life, you're either headed into a storm, you're in a storm, or you're coming out of a storm. I don't know if that's true or not. I know that's where that principle came. And so today I, I thought, you know what, could I find a place in Scripture that like sums up Paul's life about this issue because he was always dealing with difficulty. He was always, listen, very few people will deal with the amount of difficulty the Apostle Paul dealt with. And so I've entitled this message, Through the Storm. And I want to talk to you this morning, and listen, I'm telling you, this does not come out of my life as far as just theory. I've had to live this. And so this is some practical stuff as we take the scriptures, we open up together, and then we apply them to our life about how do you handle difficulty in life? How do you handle a storm in life? C.S. Lewis, who is a, a theologian, C.S. Lewis would say this, you will never know how much you believe something until it's a matter of life and death. And that is true. That's something that difficulty reveals to us. What is really important to us? What, is, what do we really value about God and scriptures and worship and, and, and the spiritual disciplines? What, what are our values? And if you want to know what you really believe, it's how you handle a storm. It's how you handle difficulty. Uh, Mike Tyson would say this, that everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? And so what Mike Tyson is saying, you know what? Everybody has a plan until all of a sudden they get punched in the mouth and then it's all of a sudden you find out what you're really committed to you find out what you really believe and so how do you respond in life when life like sucker punches you or when life like punches you in the mouth and you cannot believe you cannot believe you're dealing with this or walking through this because when you look at this issue of difficulties when you and I walk through a storm it reveals how emotionally and spiritually mature we are it all of a sudden we it's it's like looking in a mirror 
and it reflecting back to us about our emotional maturity, how we handle situations, and our spiritual maturity. And so as we catch up on this story, and I won't read the first 10 verses, but we're going to start in verse 11 in just a few minutes. If you look, and Paul, is, Paul has been arrested. He's been arrested for preaching the gospel. They put him on his ship. They're going to ship him to Rome. And so Paul's dream, Paul's goal, is that one day he would go to Rome and he would evangelize Rome and that it would become a Christian empire, and, and, and it did. And so we know that. But Paul didn't have the book of Acts. I mean, Paul didn't know how his life was going to play out. And so they put him on a boat. Uh, there's 276 people on board. That's important. There's 276 people on board. The night before they're going to set sail, an angel visits, the Lord visits Paul and says, whatever you do, do not allow them to, to, to set sail. Wait a few days. Just wait a few days because you're headed into a storm. You're headed into a typhoon. And so that next, that next morning, Paul gets up. He, he, tells, he tells everybody that. And he tells the centurion who was really in charge. And the centurion told the pilot. And then they became impatient. And they decided, you know what? We're going to set sail anyway. That ever happened to you whenever in life, whenever we get impatient and we get ahead of God and we say, you know, this is not working out quick enough for me, so I'm going to force it to happen. I'm going to make it happen. A lot of times, if we're not careful, we'll end up in a shipwreck. This is really a story about how to navigate a shipwreck in life. And may maybe you're here this morning and say, you know what, I've, I've had some shipwrecks in my life. Maybe you're in one right now and you say, you know what, I've, I've had an emotional shipwreck in my life. I've become discouraged, I've become depressed, I've suffered from anxiety, despair, fear of the future, all of those things to the point it has almost paralyzed me. And maybe you would say, you know what, my deal is, is I've been in an emotional uh, shipwreck, or, or maybe yours is an emotional, and maybe yours is a relational shipwreck. And maybe there's some relationships around you that are like blowing apart or they're like strained because of the season we're in, because of what we're going through. And relationships for you are navigating through relationships are difficult. And you would say, you know what, that, that's me. I've done that. Maybe, maybe yours is a financial shipwreck. Maybe it's COVID related. Maybe your business is shut down or maybe you're tr having trouble finding employees and people to work or, or, or maybe you've lost your job or maybe something has impacted you financially and you say, you know what, my issue right now, mine may be, I've, I've walked through this or, or may maybe you're like our family and you say, you know what, we're, we're in a health crisis, we're, we're in a health shipwreck right now. I mean, whether it's a, a diagnosis of a, of a mom or a dad, a husband, a wife, a child, a daughter, a son, or maybe someone real close to you, maybe right now when you sit in this place, you have someone that is in the hospital right now struggling to get better and struggling. And so this morning, just two points and then some sub points of how we navigate through this. I want to help you. And so when, when you face difficulties in life, and listen, let me tell you something, I, I'm telling you. I am not coming to you this morning as, 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 as a theologian or this is theory. This is real to me. This is I know this works because I've had to live this out. My family's had to live this out in our life. And so when you're experiencing difficulties, when you're experiencing a shipwreck, the first thing is this, is when you're entering a storm. When you, listen, when you know, Paul knew, hey, we do this, a storm is coming. And so you know the signs and you know you're entering in. And just, just a few things about this. The first thing is, is this, when you're entering a storm, the first thing is this, you better be careful who speaks into your life. I don't know if you know this or not, but if you go into difficulty in life, if you go into a shipwreck in life, whether it's emotional, financial, relational, health oriented, it's like everybody's an expert around you, right? Everybody knows what you should do. Everybody knows what they would do if they were in your situation, even though they've never gone through that situation. And so, you listen, I'm telling you, you have to be very careful who you allow to speak into your life. Uh, verse 11, Acts chapter 27, we're just going to pick up the story, and it says, But the centurion paid attention to the captain and the owner of the ship rather than to what Paul said, and really rather than to what God said. I mean, Paul told them, this is, the angel of the Lord appeared to me. It was real. We're headed in, we're, we're headed, and all of a sudden, they, they, they ignored, they ignored what God had said. And you know who they listened to? They listened to the experts of their day. And because the experts of their day said it was okay, they decided, you know what, regardless of what God says, we're going to do it. I don't know if you know this or not, but there's a lot of experts in our life, right? They're on cable news, they're on talk radio, they're politicians, government officials, and they're the experts. And everybody is telling you 
what to do, but I'm, I'm just here to tell you, based on his word, if God tells you to do something and an expert tells you to do something different, do what God told you to do. Just do what God told you to do. It's in this season, I'm telling you, here's a formula. I like mathematical formulas. Here's a formula. Faith plus wisdom equals walking in the will of God. It is not faith over fear. It is faith plus wisdom equals walking in the will of God. You know what wisdom is? Proverbs 1, um, verses 1 through 7. You can get the definition. You can read it for yourself about wisdom. Uh, but Paul, I'm sorry, but the writer of Proverbs prayed for this issue of wisdom. Remember Solomon? Remember when before Solomon became king and he was known as one of the wisest kings we have ever known? And God came to him and says, you know what? I'll, ask me one thing. I'll give you whatever you ask for. What did Solomon say? I, I need wisdom. So the definition of wisdom is this. The definition of wisdom is seeing the problem and then knowing what God would have you to do. Everybody can see the problem. The 276 people that were on board, everybody saw the problem. We're headed into a storm. But wisdom, wisdom is not just being able to see the problem. Anybody can see the problem, right? Wisdom is being able to see the problem and then know out of the scriptures how God wants you to respond. Second thing is this, be really skeptical of pro pop, uh, popular uh, opinion or majority opinion. I mean, when you look at this, the majority is not always right. In verse 12. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority, that's important. See, that's like underlined in my, in my Bible because the majority, they're going to go with the majority vote. Decided to set sail from there, hoping somehow to reach Phoenix, a harbor on Crete facing the southwest and the northwest to winter there. So the majority got together and decided, okay, so we got this storm coming, so here's the deal. We'll try to get as close as we can, okay? We'll, tr we'll, we'll just try to, we'll try to get as close as we can. We'll try to beat the storm. And so the majority decided, you know what, we're going to do it anyway based upon the circumstances. We're going to talk about circumstances in a few minutes. And so they decided to take a vote. And so there's 276 people on, on this boat, and 273 voted, you know what, set sail. Set sail. Circumstances look great. Three, Paul and two of his, Paul and two of his buddies said, no, don't do it because God said don't do it. A lot of people think, so, you know what, the majority has to be right. Everybody cannot be wrong. Remember the children of Israel? We've talked about Moses' life. Remember they got up to the brink, they got up to the edge of the promised land. They sent the ten spies in. The ten spies came out. The majority, the eight, said, hey, we cannot do this. The cities are well fortified and there's giants in the land and we cannot take the land. Let's don't do it. But two, Joshua and Caleb had faith plus wisdom. Equals following the will of God. And the two, Joshua and Caleb, said, you're exactly right. I mean, you're exactly right. You see the problem the same way we do. There are giants in the land. The land is well fortified. Uh, the, the cities are well fort fortified. There's giants in the land. But guess what? God is with us. God told us to take a land. We can do it. And what happened? They went the way of the majority. And they wandered in the desert for like 40 years. Well, listen, I'm telling you, when you go through crisis, there will always be somebody, there will always be someone that thinks they're an expert and tell you how to handle that situation. Here's another one, and we, I've kind of touched on it. Be, be cautious of relying on circumstances. Listen, circumstances will lie to you. Circumstances will get you and I in trouble every time. They decided we can set sail because the, 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 the seas are calm, the sun is out, there's hardly, hardly a breeze, so the circumstances are telling we can do this. Listen, circumstances can lie to you. I, this was brought home to me just this is last week, and so I have a friend that I've built a relationship with uh, that is, is like, he's, a, he's an atheist. I don't think he's ever been in church in his life, and, and so he has no frame of reference of church, and so I tell him all the time, you're like the nicest atheist I've ever met. He tells me, well, you're the nicest Christian I've ever met, and so we've built this relationship, and we're just friends. He's not a project or anything like that. I genuinely care about him. He's a friend, and so we were working through when we could get together for, for lunch, and we're texting back and forth, and finally we, we get the time, and we get the place, and I said, great, see you there. And so normally what we do is, I mean, I'll tell him, I'll let him know, hey, by the way, I'm praying for you. 
And he'll say the things like, hey, I'm sending positive vibes your way. I'm sending positive thoughts your way. I'm sending positive emotions your way. And that's just kind of our deal. And so anyway, so we, so we found a place to meet. And so I said, great, see you there. And then he sent back, shocking to me, he sent back me, you know, the, the prayer emoji. You guys know what that is? We're all Christians. We should know what that is. And so, okay, so the prayer emoji, right? We know that? Okay. He sends that back to me. And it was like one of those moments in a movie. I mean, I, I got emotional. I go, finally. And I'm like, what do I do? This is amazing. What do I do with this? And so the circumstances are telling me, you know, like, like touchdown. I mean, now he's praying. So I decided to ask a few clarifying questions. And so I texted him back and just said, hey, thank you for your prayers. He said, I didn't pray for you. I said, yes, you did. He said, I did not pray for you. I said, yes, you did. You used the praying hands emoji. <laughs> Dead quiet. And then he answers back, my bad. I thought that was the high five <laughs> emoji. I'd never thought of that of you. I, he says, I thought I was giving you a high five, like, great. And he goes, I go, no, in the Christian world, that's praying hands. And he goes, no wonder I've gotten some odd responses to that to some of my other buddies. And so, so <laughs> circumstance, I'm just telling you, circumstances will lie to you. Watch this, verse 13. When a gentle south wind, wind sprang up, they thought they had achieved their purpose. They weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. They thought it was a nice day for sailing. Have you, have you ever been headed into a storm and you didn't know you were headed into a storm because of the circumstances? You thought you'd achieved your purpose? You thought things were going your way? Oh, you thought you got what you wanted. This is what I wanted. But God said, don't do it. You're headed into a storm. But they went anyway and they were shipwrecked. Listen, let me just tell you something. It's faith plus wisdom equals walking in the will of God. That's why you do not walk through every door that is open for you. I know that goes against all of our Christian ease sayings and refrigerator magnets that if God, if God closes a door, he opens a window, right? Or if God opens a door, then just walk through it. That's fatalism. Paul, just real quickly, Paul. Paul says in the book of Corinthians that God has opened up a door wide for me for the gospel in Macedonia. So open door principle, tell oh, Paul, you should go. But Paul, faith plus wisdom, Paul goes, but wait a minute. My friend Titus is not there, so I'm not going to go. He delayed his trip. He waited. It's faith plus wisdom. You don't automatically walk through every door that is open for you. You don't take advantage of every opportunity you have. You, listen, you, you, you do not ex accept every job offer that is offered to you. I mean, you don't date everybody that asks you out on a date. I mean, it's this issue of faith plus wisdom. You need to come to the place where you ask God, God, what do you want? What does your word say? What does the scripture say? Just because your circumstances or my circumstances says it's okay doesn't mean it's okay. I mean, you look at this issue. They thought they, ob they, thought they had obtained what they wanted. Paul said don't do it. And this brings us to maybe one of the most difficult principles of this issue of walking through difficulty in life. The most difficult shipwrecks to walk through in your life are the ones that you did not cause. It was not your decision. You're just kind of along for the ride. I mean, remember Paul? Paul's like, hey, don't do it. God has already told us don't do it. If you do it, we're going to end up in a shipwreck. It's going to end bad. Do not do it. I vote against it. He stood alone. He was isolated. All of they decide to go. They decide to ignore his advice. They go. They're now in a shipwreck. Paul is down in the hull of the ship. And guess what? He's having to experience the storm. Because of somebody else's decision. The most difficult shipwrecks to walk through in life are those that you did not cause. Are those that it was not your decision. In other words, you were like, you were the one that was saying, hey, don't do this or change or whatever or go different directions. And when you look at this, well, 
I don't know who needs to hear this. I just know someone in this room needs to hear this. Not all shipwrecks are your fault. Not all of them are your fault. And if you're not careful, if you are not careful, you will take responsibility for somebody else's decision. You will take responsibility for somebody else's sin. Not all shipwrecks are your fault. I mean, when you look at this, you realize this wasn't Paul's fault. But even if it's not your fault, God still wants you to learn something from the difficulty. God still wants you to grow, and God still wants you to mature. And even when you go through a shipwreck in life, whether it's, whether it's something that you've done or whether it's something somebody else did, whether it was something that someone else did to intentionally hurt you, whether Satan meant it for harm, but God meant it for good, you've got to remember that God's purpose is greater than your pain, and God's purpose is greater than your problem, and God's purpose is greater than your situation. And, you, and, and God is more interested in growing your character and, and, and th than your comfort. And so when you look at this, you've got to ask yourself, does God have a word for me when I'm in a shipwreck? And it wasn't my fault. I, and I'm going through difficulty. Absolutely. Don't give up. In Galatians 6, 9, just real quickly, let us not grow weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if, what? If we do not give up. When you look at this issue, Paul didn't give up. And yeah, Paul was probably frustrated. And yeah, he's probably aggravated. But it was this issue of faith over wisdom. And when you look at this, God, even through, even through crisis in life and even through difficulty. Listen, God has used difficulty and crisis in my life to grow me up, to mature me emotionally and spiritually than anything else. We talked about this last week when we went through the book of Job. And so there's this first thing is when you're entering a storm, how do you respond? But the second thing is this, is when you're, when you're experiencing the storm. I mean, now when you're, when you're like you're headed into the storm and you know it's coming, winds are changing, waves are changing, and now you're, now, now you're in it. And so here, here's some things as we just walk through these scriptures together. And the first thing is this, you've got to be careful not to drift. You've you got to be careful not to coast. You, well, verse 14, Acts 27. But before long, a fierce wind called the northeast, northeast, Northeaster rushed down from the island. Since the ship was caught and unable to head into the wind, we gave way to it. And we were driven along. Now listen, there, 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 there's, there's 276 people on board. They're headed to, to, to Rome, right? And so they're headed to Rome. For 14 days, what the scripture tells us, for 14 days, they couldn't see the sun, they couldn't see the moon, they couldn't see the stars. And so that doesn't seem like a big deal to us, right? You know, what's the big deal? You know, you, you, got, you got an iPhone. I mean, you got turn-by-turn -turn directions. You got radar. I mean, what's the big deal? See, the big deal for them, they could not get their bearings. They could not get their bearings. They didn't even know where they were. They were being beaten by the wind. They were being beaten by the waves. They were being tossed, and they couldn't see the sun. They couldn't see the moon. They couldn't see the North Star. They couldn't see the constellations. They had no clue. Listen, they had no clue where they were, and so they couldn't get their bearings. Have you ever been in a shipwreck? Have you ever been in a storm to where emotional, relational with your health, financial, whatever, and it was like, I can't get my bearings. You know what we would say? In fact, is I've said this. Maybe you've said this, especially in my life in the season we're in. There's some times that I've said, you know what? Nothing makes sense to me. Nothing makes sense what we're walking through. Nothing makes sense what's happening. Nothing makes sense to me. But the danger is, is if you start to drift, the scripture says we gave way to it and we were driven along. If you're not careful, you may not actually give up you say you know what I I no longer have a purpose in life I no longer have direction I'm just going to coast through life why does it even matter why even try I mean nothing makes sense I tried like really hard and we just drift we lose our goals we lose our purpose we lose our ambition we lose energy to life and some of those other things. Here's another one. Be careful not to act impulsively. I mean, you, this, this is just like a major problem. The story, verse 18, 
because we were being severely battered by the storm, they began to jettison the cargo the next day. So now there's 14 days in the Mediterranean Ocean, no sunlight, they don't know where they are, and so all of a sudden they panic, and you know what they do? They start th throwing stuff overboard. They start throwing things that, that, that were once valuable, important to them. So they throw cargo overboard, and then that wasn't enough. They throw tackle overboard, which they would need, and then it's crazy. Then they start throwing food overboard. Hello, you might need some food. And they begin throwing food overboard. They're about ready to throw prisoners overboard. That may have been the most serious one of all, because if they had made it to Rome, which eventually they do, but they make it to Rome, and they didn't have the prisoners, the pilot, the centurion, they'd all be put to death. They'd all be put to death. And so this is like, now it's like, it's just like suicide. I mean, well, we'll just throw the, the prisoners overboard. And Paul steps in and says, no, you, you can't do that. But listen, let me tell you something. When you're in difficulty and you start to coast and you start to drift, the danger is that you can act impulsively and you start abandoning values and principles and, and, and things and relationships that were once important to you. Your value of worship, your value of prayer, your value of opening scripture, your value of serving him, your value of giving, your value of godly relationships around you. If you're not careful, you can toss some valuable relationships overboard that mean a lot to you. If you're not careful, you'll start throwing out some things that like five years ago meant a great deal to you. Your values and your heritage and your family and your relationships. And God said, God, God came back to them and said, hey, Stay with the ship. If you'll stay with the ship, you'll be saved. You know what he's saying? Stay with your values. Stay with your priorities. I've watched so many people that when they go through difficulty in life and life doesn't make sense to them, they begin to push the scriptures away. They begin to push worship away. They begin to uh, push God away or godly relationships. Says, you know what? This just isn't, isn't working. Look at this, verse 31. So Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut the ropes holding the skiff, the lifeboats, and they let it drop away. Have you, have you done that? In like your life and situations that God, I, I'm cutting away the escape plan. I'm cutting away the lifeboats. God, I'm staying with you. I, I, am, I am staying. With, remember when Jesus, uh, he, he preached a really, really hard sermon and like hundreds of people walked away. The fact is they all walked away from it. And he turned around to the disciples and said, hey, you guys going to walk away too? And they'd cut the lifeboats. Remember Simon Peter says, no, where would we go? No, where would we go? What would we do? I've learned from personal experience when you face a storm, it is not God's will for us to run from it or even try to ignore it or avoid it, but to confront it. And so here's another one. Be careful not to despair. I mean, be careful not to despair in verse 10. For many days, neither sun nor stars appeared, and, and a severe storm kept raging. Finally, all hope was fading that we should be saved. They've given up everything, values and relations. Uh, they've given up everything. Can I tell you, when you know you're in danger when you're going through a storm is when you have lost hope. You know how you know and I know when we've lost hope? When you believe next week's not going to be any better than this week. Next month, no better than this month. Next year, no better than this year. Uh, fact is, it's never. It's never going to be any better. The last thing to go, listen, I'm just telling you. The last thing to go in your life is this issue of hope. And the reason we, the reason we lose hope is we have forgotten that God is in the storm with you. And God is still so sovereign and God is still in control. The first hurdle, and I talked about this last week, the first hurdle that we all have to get over in suffering and pain is this issue is, is God still sovereign? Can God do whatever he wants? Is God still in control? Now, we can read this story, and we know, but Paul didn't know that. Can I just tell you, just as a, as a, as a, as a personal t just testimony, my wife and I, Karen, we were talking about this other night, and this is absolutely like the worst year of our life with everything that we're facing. And yet, our intimacy with Jesus, our relationship to him, is never, has never been stronger than it is today. 
It is possible. It is possible in the midst of a storm where nothing makes sense and say, you know what, I'm, but I'm, st I'm still with the ship. I'm still connected to him. Here's another one. Be careful not to blame. This is why, this is why a lot of times things begin to melt down is because instead of people taking responsibility for their actions and responsibility for their life, they begin, they begin to blame everybody else. Ever been in a situation like that? To like nobody wants to accept responsibility for anything? Or that other person that kind of caused a storm and they're like blaming everybody else? And, and in verse 21, since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood among them and said, you men should have followed my advice and not sail from, uh, from Crete and sustain this damage and loss. In other words, Paul was helping to bring them to the place to where they just accept responsibility. Yeah, we shouldn't have made that decision. Yeah, we shouldn't have set sail. That's all Paul was doing. But, but here's another one. Be careful not to become overwhelmed. It is so easy in a storm when, when the wind is blowing and the waves are beating against you and you don't know where you are just to be overwhelmed. Verse 34, he says, Paul, this is just such helpful for advice. Uh, so I urge you to take some food, for this is for your survival, since none of you will lose a hair from your head. After he had said these things, he had taken some bread, given thanks to God in the presence of them, and then he broke it, and he began to eat. And so he's praying for them. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about self-care. Uh, verse 36, they all encouraged, they were, they were they all were encouraged and took food themselves. They hadn't eaten for 14 days. In all, there were 276 of us on the ship, and when they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship. Everything begins to change. By throwing the grain overboard to sea, when daylight came, they did not recognize the land but sighted a bay with a beach. They planned to run the ship ashore, and all of a sudden they got a plan, if, if they could. After cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time loosening the ropes that held the riders, and they hoisted the foresail to the skin, to the wind, and headed for the beach. When, when we get under stress and when we're in tension and we're in a crisis and we're, when we're overwhelmed, here's what happens to a lot of people. You, you quit self-care. You have trouble eating. You have, you, you have trouble sleeping. You're, you no longer practice the hobbies that once gave you life, right? There's no passion in life. And not only that, that, there's a lot of times that some people that I've talked with, they feel guilty. Like, we're in this crisis. Man, my family is at this crisis. I cannot pull away and take care of, of like, myself. I, I, I'm not going to eat right. I can't sleep because guess what? It's all up to me. It's all up to me to fix this. And so I'm going to feel guilty if I, if I do something that once gave me life, if I'm going to do something that is helpful to me. Listen, Paul is telling them, you know what? The only way that you can face a storm is take care of yourself first. Unless you take care of yourself, you cannot take care of anyone else. We get that on airline flight, right? When they tell you to put the oxygen mask on yourself first, once you're able to breathe, once you have ox oxygen, then take care of your children. But if you pass out before you put the oxygen mask on your kids, you can't help your kids. And Paul got that, and Paul understood that. Paul understood that God is sovereign and in control. Verse 22, now I urge you to take courage because there will be no loss of any of your lives, but only the ship. For last night an angel of God I belong to and served stood by me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. It is necessary for you to appear before Caesar. And indeed, God has graciously given you all those who are sailing with you. So take courage, men, because I believe God that it will be just the way he has told me. In other words, God said we're going to make it. We're going to make it. Let's trust him. And you see that everything begins to change in that moment. Verse 41, but they struck a sandbar, sandbar and, and ran the ship aground. The bow jammed fast and remained immovable while the stern began to break up by the pounding of the waves. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners so that no one could swim away and escape. But the centurion kept them from carrying out their plan because they wanted to save Paul. And so he ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first to get to land. The rest were to follow, some on planks, some on debris from the ship. In this way, everyone safely reached the shore. You see this over and over in Scripture. 
about God's plan, and God took care of them, and God, God was a part of it. When you look at this story, you realize that God provided the centurion. They were going to kill Paul. They were going to and, and something happened. The book of Revelation. Now listen, everybody, everybody makes the book of Re Re Revelation uh, because it's just kind of interesting to talk about charts and graphs and beast and antichrist and imagery and when's Jesus going to come back and all of those things. Can I just tell you, that's not the main point of the book of Revelation. You know what the main point of the book of Revelation is? God is worthy to be praised. God is worthy. Jesus is worthy to be worshipped. That even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of difficulty, that he is worthy. He is worthy to be praised. And you can trust him. I mean, God had a plan for Paul's life, and God has a plan for your life. In Revelation chapter 3, the scripture says, when God opens a door, no man can shut that door. And when God has a plan for you, and God has a, a, a door he opens for you, and you walk with wisdom, and you walk through that door, guess what? No man can shut that door, and you can trust him. If you're walking through a storm, would you just simply trust him? Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? With your heads bowed and eyes closed, let me ask you, what is God saying to you? What is God saying to you as a result of this message? And more importantly, what is, what is your next response? Every one of us in this room has a next response. And so what is yours? Do you need to accept him and ask him to come into your life and to forgive you of your sins and give you the gift of eternal life? And maybe, maybe that's not your next response. Maybe that's your first response. We just pray a prayer and ask him, Dear Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sins and give me the gift of eternal life. And maybe you've already done that. And so maybe, maybe your response is, if you're walking through a storm, would you just stay with the ship? And stay with the values and the principles that he has given you. Maybe, maybe you're here this morning and say, you know what, I, I just need somebody to pray for me. That I'm walking through a difficult time in my life. I'm walking through a storm. And if that's you, listen, you do not need to be embarrassed by that. Every one of us in this room needs prayer, but from time to time, we all, we all need prayer. And so maybe you're like our family. We've asked for a lot of prayer in these last few weeks, and so maybe, maybe you just need prayer. Maybe it's relational. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's emotional. Maybe it's, you know what, maybe you just want to pray for someone else that's going through a difficult time. Maybe you need wisdom and discernment. Maybe it's a great thing and you just need, there's an open door for you and you don't know whether you should take it or not. And maybe you just need to pray for wisdom and discernment what to do. If you need prayer, we want to pray for you. In just a few minutes, I'm going to pray. And after I pray, we're going to stand. And in that moment, we're not going to be in that moment long, but if you need prayer in any area of your life for any reason, we just want to pray for you. So as we stand up in just a few minutes after I pray, there's something for every one of us to do in this moment where we're standing and praying for those who are responding or whether, whether we're responding. And we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to add our faith to your faith. So if you need prayer, you come after I pray and we stand. Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for your love and we thank you for your grace. And Lord, we ask that you'd pull this church very closely to you. That Father, we'd just respond to you. That Lord, that you, we would know that you are here with us, that you hear our prayers and that you respond. Father, we thank you that what turned this story around in Acts 27 was prayer, was just prayer. And so may we, may we place our burdens before you, and may you respond to those this morning. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand with me, and, and as you stand, that if you have a prayer request, if you have a need, if you're carrying a burden, then we'd love to pray for you this morning. So as you stand up, would you step out, begin making your way down to the front of the room. We have some prayer partners here. We have people walking with you, but you do not need to be a member. You don't have to be a member of Fellowship of the Rockies, but if you need prayer in any of your life for any reason, then we just want to pray for you. So just make your way down to the front. We'll guide you. We'll direct you, and that we would love to pray for you and encourage you. So you just come. You come. Tell us your name, how we could pray for you, and we'd love to have the opportunity to pray for you.
As people are making their way down, if that's you, you just keep making your way down. We'll guide you and we'll direct you. There's a, there's a contact card in front of you. And so if you've made a decision, maybe you've accepted Christ. We would love to know about that. Maybe you want to follow him in believer's baptism in December. We're baptizing again. We already got people signed up for that. We would love to include you in on that. You can take that card out. You can complete that. Place that in one of the boxes on your way out. Also, if you're watching online, you can do it almost the same way. You go to the top of the screen, and then you click Connect Card, and you can fill it out that way. But we would love to connect with you if you'd like to connect with us any way that we can. Before our benediction, may you receive this as the word of the Lord for you. And uh, this is what the scripture says. May the Lord bless you. And may the Lord protect you. And may the Lord make his face shine on you. And may the Lord be gracious to you. And may the Lord look on favor, with favor on you. And may the Lord give you peace. May you know the peace of Christ as you go through your week. May you remi be reminded that he is with you and that he, you can have his peace. God bless you. Thank you for being here this weekend.